there were two kings who sat on the same throne. One of the kings was guilty of becoming passionately preoccupied with his neighbor's wife. He plotted to have his neighbor, who was his friend and a leader in his army, killed. Then he committed adultery with that man's wife. That man was recorded in the Bible as being a man after God's heart. That man's predecessor, who sat on the same throne, was guilty of only a small little sin, incomplete obedience. The one man is lifted up as an example. The other man lost his family, his nation, and his spiritual authority. What was the difference between these two men? The difference was humility. Saul lost everything. And David regained everything. And the reason was that David learned how to repent. He learned how to humble himself. And the Bible calls him a man after God's heart. The question is not, do we sin? The question is not, do we have pride in our heart? The question is, how will we respond when God exposes that in our heart? Humility is the key. And I'd like to suggest to you today, that our victory has been won for us on the cross. It would be so easy to go through a series of tapes like this. This is the third in the series on humility. It would be so easy to go through all this teaching and become overwhelmed with our own sense of inadequacy or sense of failure. We could look at all these things and we could just go into condemnation, introspection in our own heart, throw up our hands and give up. But I want to encourage you to cast yourself upon the Lord because He has won the victory for us. He has conquered pride in all of its manifestations. All that He asks of us is that we humble ourselves. In a sense, humility is just saying, yes, Jesus, I need you. It's not so much what you do, but it's an attitude of heart to receive. Humility allows us to receive God's blessing and His grace in our lives. We're going to keep going through some of these characteristics of pride. And then we want to look at how to be free and God's steps of how do you work out that humility in your life. One of the aspects of pride that I think it's important for us to look at carefully is sarcasm. Sarcasm usually comes out in our humor. It usually expresses itself through making fun, poking fun at people, particularly individuals or races of people. I think if any of us have been in a place where somebody has made fun of us, or made jokes about us, and it was not something we wanted to be made fun of, you know how hurtful it can be. I don't think God really laughs when we make fun of each other. Laughing with each other over silly little things we do, mistakes we make, yes, that's okay. When somebody can laugh at themselves, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's humility. But to poke fun at somebody with a mean spirit or criticalness or behind their back, it's pride. Sarcasm is a horrible thing. And it can be very hurtful. It can be very divisive. I encourage us not to be part of it. What do you do when somebody tells a sarcastic joke? I think we need to have enough humility not to laugh. What do we do when somebody develops a cynical spirit or a sarcastic way of carrying themselves? Or they make comments toward other people? I think we actually, at times, most of the time, if not all the time, need just to be go silent and reserved. Or just express to them that we don't appreciate it. We don't want to be a part of it. Have enough humility to want to please God and not worry about what people say. Leading right on from sarcasm is a judgmental or critical spirit. Call it whatever you want. Complaining, whining, whimpering, gossiping, slandering. It comes out of pride. Criticalness is our way of lifting ourselves up and putting another person down. It's focusing on their weakness in a way that God is not doing it. Talking about somebody else, even if you speak the truth about the person, the Bible calls slander. You see, you don't have to lie about somebody. 
to be critical. In fact, I'd like to suggest that any one of us, any single one of us, any Christian, could be stood right here today, right in front of this camera, right in front of this group, any single person, and we could pick out their faults and run them down. Is there anybody who could stand the scrutiny of a bunch of critics and judges who would look at our weaknesses? Is that God's way? I don't think so, is it? In fact, he expressly instructs us in the word not to speak anything about each other except that which edifies. In Ephesians chapter 4. Boy, that's a high standard. And it's one that I'm continually challenged by. Yesterday I was with a group of people and we were planning for our leadership school here as part of All Nations Institute. And I haven't had a chance to make it right with them, but I said something about a person, and I didn't even name the person, but I felt convicted when I said it. It was unnecessary. Everybody knew who I was talking about. I went to one of my brothers afterwards, and I said, I think I crossed the line. He said, I think so too. The human tongue, the Bible says, who can tame it? God wants to build grace. He wants to edify. He wants to heal. And when we criticize, when we reveal one another's weaknesses, when we expose, when we pass on gossip, when we receive it, we're participating in a sin. Sally and I went to speak at, uh, in a Christian community fellowship a number of years ago. And there was a young lady there from this uh, congregation that was assigned to us to be in charge of kind of hospitality, receiving us, making sure we had our needs met, and transportation. And, and uh, she was a lovely young lady, but I found myself reacting to her. And I, I told Sally, I said, I don't understand, but I, I don't like her, but there's no reason. And I was critical of her. So I asked God to forgive me, but it didn't go away. I repented. I I stood against it. I tried to do everything I could. It just stayed in my heart. And finally, I was praying. I said, Lord, what is it you want to teach me? And I thought about a conversation that had happened nine months earlier. I think it was nine months. It was a long time earlier. I was sitting with some person, and that person had told me about this young lady, and I'd forgotten all about it. But when they spoke about her, they spoke negatively. And I received into my spirit the offense that that person had. I'd forgotten about it, but it still was there, and it affected my relationship. Only when I was able to pray that through, and God reminded me of what I'd done, was I able to really get free and to see this young lady as who she really was in Christ, without seeing her negatively through the eyes and the offense of another person. Criticalness and judgmentalness can be, as we said earlier in one of the other sessions, just a way of God revealing something He wants to do in our own heart. If we struggle with somebody, maybe the issue is not their weakness, but our ability to love people. Maybe the issue is not they have a fault, but how God wants to stretch us to be more forgiving and forbearing. Humility will set us free. You know, if God's forgiven us, then we should be able to forgive others and accept them. I'd like to suggest a spiritual exercise. If you have trouble loving somebody, one of the things that I was instructed that I should do when I struggle like that is I should go back to the Lord in prayer and remind myself of how much He has forgiven me and allow Him to refresh my heart and mind of all the things that I have done that have grieved God and disappointed Him. And then when I get in my proper place, in brokenness before God, reminded of all that He's done for me, that I will be able to look at others a little bit differently. And I suggest that as a help to you. Impatience is a characteristic of pride. When you don't like somebody or you can't wait for them and you just rush or you push or you, you won't 
uh, wait for them, for whatever God's doing in their heart. The real root issue here is that we don't love them the way God loves them. And if we humble ourselves, we'll be able to be patient and forbear them. I've struggled with impatience. Uh, and it comes out when I'm tired, especially. It comes out other times, but especially if I'm tired or I'm under stress, I can get sharp, I can get short. I, I'm, I don't want to listen, I just want to get it done. But you know there's no excuse for it because what it's really saying is this person that I'm with or people don't deserve my best. And they don't deserve respect and love. And God holds me responsible for it. Self-sufficiency is an indication of pride. The old saying goes something like this, I will be the captain of my ship, I will be the rudder of my soul. If you are dependent upon yourself to work out your problems, you use your own standards and your own judgment to evaluate what's good and bad for you, then there is a danger that you're in pride. Self-sufficiency. Self-pity is an indication of pride. Some of the most proud people I've known have been some of the wounded, most wounded people. You see, you don't have to be a together person to be proud. <laughs> In fact, many times one of the greatest hindrances to getting over our inferiorities and insecurities is pride itself. If there's not a desperate commitment, a ruthless commitment to go God's way of humility, to expose, to pursue God, to humble ourselves, then pride can keep its grip on your heart and your wounds can fester away. Let me read to you a quote. Many an inferiority complex is only pride backfiring. Most people with an inferiority complex are as proud as Lucifer underneath and love attention and acclaim. You can never have real humility while you're preoccupied with yourself. You can never have real humility while you are preoccupied with yourself. If you struggle with insecurity, get it out in the open. If you struggle with self-consciousness, you fear and worry if people love you, accept you, if you've done the right thing, then walk in humility because the danger is you're going to be constantly preoccupied, self-conscious about yourself. What do people think about me? Do they love me? Do they accept me? Am, am I doing okay? And it's all around you. Self-pity can be like a giant pit, <laughs> a great big hole that just spirals deeper and deeper and you just feed more and more self-attention. And God says to cut across that with humility. Expose your need. Bring it into the light. Bring it to the cross of Jesus. Let me go on with this quote. You can never have real humility while you're preoccupied with yourself. And an inferiority complex is the most self-centered state of mind in the world. Shyness can be a form of conceit. It can keep us from obeying God. Another indicator of pride is flattery. Flattery. I'll never forget going and teaching um, for a Christian group and a young lady coming up to me afterwards, and I fell for this for a while. I have to admit, she, she got me. She said, um, oh, thank you for your teaching. It was just wonderful. Nice smile, fluttering eyelashes. You're, you're so compassionate and kind. I so appreciate you. What's going on here? <laughs> She's just building me up. Flattering me, appealing to what? <laughs> Pride. <laughs> You're such a godly man, and you know, I just sense that you really understand people. And one of the teachers here, the counselors, has not really been very understanding, been kind of mean spirited. I just need somebody like you to, to help me. Uh oh. I walked away from that feeling, wow. I'm a really great guy, she told me. 
I got back to my room. I woke up the next morning. I started thinking about it. I thought, something just felt wrong. What was that? <laughs> it was a conviction of the Holy Spirit. Remember when the cancer starts to grow, it feels something's wrong. And boy, the Holy Spirit was saying something was wrong. And I started praying. And I thought, oh man, did I ever buy into that? What made me susceptible to it? Undealt with pride. There was a longing in my heart for approval. I just wanted somebody to say, you did okay, you're great, but I took it too far. And I had to go back to that young lady and say to her, you know, I would love to get together with you. Why don't we do it with your counselor so we can work it through together? And I want to tell you, you've never seen anybody do any backpedaling as fast as that young lady. She, in fact, she got angry with me. And boy, she lashed out. Isn't it interesting? One day I was a hero, the next day I was a bad guy, just simply because I wanted to get her together with the person that she had a problem with. Don't let flattery set you up. Don't let it appeal to your pride. Don't let somebody probe your spirit. I was telling a group of people yesterday, in fact, that same group I referred to, some of our leaders and staff, about a man who came into our organization in the um, guise of being a donor. And he, um, he said he came with a gift of a million dollars. And uh, he wanted to spend some time with us just to get to know us so that he felt that he was giving this to a worthy cause. And then he went around to different ones of us in a conference and he probed our spirits to see if we were susceptible or open to receiving criticism against others in the group. And he would go to one person and he'd say, man, I can see you, you're, you're, you're radical, man, you're sold out. There's some others here that are not, not really committed like you are. And if people reacted to that and would not accept it, he didn't go any further. But if he sensed an openness in their spirit, then he'd go a little further. He would look for an offense. He would look for a hurt. He would look for a disagreement. And then he'd build on it. You know, this is what Absalom did. Absalom was offended by his father David. And the Bible describes him sitting at the gate of the city. And as people came to receive judgment from King David, he would call them over. And he would say something like, are you hurt? You're going through a hard time? Well, tell me. I, I care. Oh, man, I really understand what you're going through. Oh, man, that's terrible. The king hasn't done anything yet? What kind of king is that? Man, I'll, I'll do something for you. You see the pattern? I care. They don't. I'll listen. I'm with you. They don't. I can tell you about a cult. They got inroads into a Christian group. And one of the ways it happened is spiritual leaders of this cult would go to people and they would say something like this. Are you struggling with sin? <laughs> then, you know, they would talk a little while and be friendly and warm. And then, then they'd just kind of bring it up in a, in a spiritual way. Have you got complete victory yet in every area of your life? No. There's still some areas that you're struggling with. You don't even have to tell me. I just want to pray for you. By the way, do your leaders know what you're going through? And if they did, they wouldn't say anything. If they, if they said no, I'm not sure they do, or they don't know, then they would say something like this. Not quite as direct, but this is where they aim. What kind of leaders do you have that don't know what you're going through? The Bible teaches that a shepherd should know the condition of his flock. And if people bought into that, then they would build a divisive wall in their heart against their leaders. And that's pride. Be careful that you are not somebody whose spirit is open to somebody else coming with an offense toward a third party and they try to find support for their cause, for their offense, for their wound, for their disagreement, and you take it in and carry it around. And the Bible calls this taking up the offense of another. And it's sin. Be careful. It can start with flattery. 
Comparison is a form of pride. The Bible says that we can compare ourselves by ourselves and among ourselves and become fools. And listen, whenever there's a comparison, somebody wins and somebody loses. If you compare yourself with inferiority, you can always feel like they're better than you. You lose, they win. If you compare yourself to other people as if you're better, you win, they lose. And the Bible says we should not be comparing ourselves, but rather seeing each other in a spiritual way as what Christ has done in us, not according to the flesh, but viewing each other as children of God, redeemed by God, purchased by His blood, that Jesus is at work in our hearts. Not according to weaknesses or strengths, that person's better, that person's weaker, that person, oh, I like that person. That can get into be such a critical kind of thing, so fleshly, so superficial. Pride manifests itself also in disloyalty. When you stand against a person, when you take up a cause against them. And lastly, pride manifests itself in resentment. When we carry an offense in our heart, thinking that we have a right not to forgive somebody, after all that God has done in Christ to forgive us. May I remind you today that Jesus has bore our sins and carried our griefs. And because he's taken all of our sins upon himself, we can be free. One of the dangers in focusing on an issue like pride is that we could actually become so aware of ourselves that we forget that Jesus has won the victory for us over our pride. I want to conclude this series and I want to conclude the teaching on this subject of pride by giving four steps of how we can have victory. And the first step is to ask Jesus for a fresh revelation of himself, who he is in his person and what he has done for us. Jesus has won the battle over our pride. And when we become a Christian, he comes to live in us. That is the guarantee of our victory. I want to say to you today, if one of these issues, one of these areas that we've talked about has spoken to your heart, if God has convicted you, in fact, maybe you're so overwhelmed that you think the whole list applies to you. I don't want you to go away and take the whole list and try and deal with it at once, by the way. God will point out one or two or three, but he's not going to point out 20 or 25 things and say, now deal with them all right now. <laughs> Praise God, he doesn't deal with us that way. He highlights one issue, and then he zeroes in on it, and he gives us the grace to overcome it. But our victory starts not with a revelation of ourselves. Our victory begins with a revelation of Jesus. Paul said to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 18, and I'd like us to read these words together. This is his prayer for the Ephesians. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. I would join with Paul today in my prayer for you and for me is that God would open the eyes of our minds and our hearts that we would see what we already have in Christ. Jesus has guaranteed your victory. Overcoming pride is not based on something you do to be a good person. Overcoming pride does not come because of all of a sudden we go out and fast and pray for days and days. That would make you a proud person. <laughs> How do we overcome? We receive what Jesus has given to us and what he's done for us. We receive who he has already made us to be, his son, his daughter, justified by faith, brought into relationship with himself. That's the beginning point of victory. Any other place to begin to have victory is less than Jesus himself. He doesn't want us to start with ourself. He doesn't want us to start with looking at the long list and getting convicted and praying for understanding. He wants us to start by going back to who he is and what he's done on the cross. He has won the victory for you and me. That's guaranteed. And unless we believe that, it's all going to be striving. But if we have the assurance in our heart, if we have that 
spiritual revelation that Paul prayed about, that Jesus is victor, and he's victor in my life, then everything else will be working out from grace, from him, from what he has done, who he is in us. So it begins, our victory begins with a revelation of Jesus. I think we also need a revelation of not only what he's done for us, but the kind of life that he lived. Philippians 2 has a wonderful statement by Paul of Jesus. It starts in verse 6 where it describes his humility. Just a couple chapters over from where we read in Ephesians. Paul says in Philippians 2, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. See, he's given us an example. He did not hold on to what was his. He laid down his rights, his reputation, his position, his glory, everything that he had, he gave it up. And you know something? He did it with the assurance that the Father had a plan for him, that the Father had a purpose, that the Father was going to be victorious through his life. And that gave him the assurance that he could give up everything. When you start with God, then everything else is victory. But if we start with ourselves, all we end up with is religion. Let's believe God for a revelation. I ask with you today, a revelation of Jesus in us and a revelation of Jesus and who he was. What a wonderful example. But it goes on from revelation to a recognition of our need. And that includes acknowledging pride and its various characteristics. God wants us to be willing to name the sin specifically for what it is. That's why we've taken time to go through in detail some, not all of the characteristics of pride, but we've tried to be, I've tried to be really detailed and name some of them. I want to encourage you, if God convicts you, name it. Call it what it is. Confess it to the Father. I've tried to be as honest as I can today. I've blown it so many times. But I want to tell you, I've found that when I humble myself, it brings liberty. Humility does not bring humiliation. Humility brings liberation. God does not want to embarrass you. He does, in fact, does not want you to go around confessing everything you've done to everybody. When I talk about humility, I don't mean dredging up every shameful thing that we've done in our lives. There are some things that should not be spoken of openly, the Bible says. Maybe you need to go to a counselor if you don't have the assurance of your forgiveness or if it's still a bondage in your life. So God doesn't want you to go around telling everybody everything, but he does want you to put a name on it. And he does want you to bring it in the open with somebody. Years ago, Senator Harold Hughes, former governor of Idaho, wrote a book and told his story. He told how he was an alcoholic. He told how he was unfaithful to his wife. He told how Jesus changed him. It was hard for his political enemies to bring his skeletons out of the closet because he had already done so. <laughs> they couldn't use anything as spiritual or emotional or political blackmail because he had brought it all out. The enemy cannot use something against you if you bring it into the light. It's when we keep things in the darkness that they get a grip on us. That's where their power is. But when you bring it into the light to Jesus, when you confess it to others and you acknowledge it, it breaks the power of sin. The blood of Jesus can be applied to that which is brought into the open. So recognize it. Call it for what it is. Name it. Name it specifically. Don't make any excuses. And confess it. Confess it to God and confess it to others with the assurance that what we bring into the open, God will forgive. It says in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. It says in that same letter, that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the assurance and the promise that you have and I have, that if we will deal with our sin, God will forgive us. 
Have you ever been in a time of confession or brokenness? Have you ever been in one of those kind of meetings or times together? You guys ever had that experience? I've, I've been in quite a few meetings like that. And you know something? When somebody, and under the leading of the Holy Spirit, brings something in the open and they confess it, you know what happens in my heart? My respect for them goes up. I have thoughts like this. Boy, they're being real. But more than even a human response of respect, the Holy Spirit in me produces a love for that person because the Holy Spirit in me loves truth. I'm not talking about Floyd. I'm talking about the indwelling Spirit of God loves truth. And when he sees truth in another person and we're open to him, he moves upon our heart to be attracted.